Good morning, everybody. Um, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name's Steve Noakes, and I'm Chairman of the Board of Binnaburra. This is actually in the 87-year history of Binnaburra, the first time we've run a stakeholder webinar online. So a little bit of history in the making for Binnaburra. Even though we're not physically together today, um, we are having, I'm, I'm, I'm at home, which is near Binnaburra here at Lamington National Park. And so we remain, I remain in the country of the several clans that are associated with Binnaburra. And we do always acknowledge the traditional custodians, including the Yugam Bear language people. And we recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. These are important messages for Binnaburra. We have a tens of thousands of years of indigenous relationship with this land. And moving forward now, we, um, with our reconciliation plan, we can do lots of really interesting things with, in partnerships with the uh, indigenous um, traditional owners of this land. And that's what, that's what we intend to do. Some of you um, in your parts of Australia, wherever you are, or internationally even, um, may have experienced bushfires in the past or some other um, event, natural disaster event. Um, in the nine odd months since we had the bushfires here at Binnaburra um, in the Beachmont community, I've noticed the way that people are still dealing with uh, um, devastation. They lost their house or they, they were threatened a lot by the fires. And I'm conscious that when we talk about bushfires and devastation or uh, it might be a cyclone or a, or a flood or a drought, um, that there are emotional uh, connections that spark in some people. So I'm mindful of that as we present and talk about what's happened to Binnaburra because this is a place with a very strong emotional connection to so many people. And I presume, especially to everybody who's tuning in here today. So, um, and I know that the event like we had in, in 8th of September last year, that, that impact of that continues to ripple in the community today. Um, and we need to be sensitive to that and, and uh, help. Not only, when I talk about community, I'm not just talking about people living at Binnaburra, at Beachmont and Binnaburra. I'm talking about all those of us who are connected in the, in the Binnaburra family. So our agenda today, after those couple of acknowledgements, um, was to uh, do some quick introductions and Zoom protocols. Um, I'll talk a little bit, of, just some background really, about the this nature of the spirit of Binnaburra uh, and our place here at Lamington National Park little refresher on the bushfire impacts on this place and the people and the business of Binnaburra Lodge. And then Tim will join us, will contribute and give us an update from the built infrastructure point of view. Tim Medhurst, you probably see Tim's photograph there. Um, Tim's done a fantastic job uh, with our reconstruction activities. Um, and then we'll also look at the next steps for Binnaburra and have a question and answer session. Um, Joining us today, a couple of, I'll just introduce a couple of my board colleagues. Um, that's uh, Ian, Ian Pritchard, who's uh, been the Interim Manager Director. Ian will finish that role next Tuesday, um, after, just before the bushfires and in the recovery process through the bushfires. He'll be, um, his role uh, as the key senior executive will be taken over by Jonathan Fisher. Jonathan joins us as CEO on Tuesday, the 1st of June, and that's his waving hand there. Um, and we're delighted that Jonathan's joining us from an incredible background experience that he's had um, in, in the last decade plus with the National Trust of Australia uh, and facilities like the Corumbin Wildlife Sanctuary and so forth. So you'll hear a lot more about Jonathan um, as we do these webinar series also. I mentioned Tim Medhurst, he's a board member and has been uh, guiding the reconstruction activities. Um, we're recording this session today. And so I bring that to your attention. If you're asking questions and answers or writing things later on, everything is being recorded. And we're doing that for history, but also to share with people who are not able to join us today so that they can also have an update. The plan is to have a series of these Zoom-based 
um, interactions with stakeholders of Binnaburra over the, between now and the annual general meeting in November. And they're basically about every two months. And in, in this era of COVID, <clears throat> um, it gives us an opportunity to reach out and have a two-way communication with people who are passionate about Binnaburra. So let me start with this idea of the spirit of Binnaburra um, from uh, just, just really from my perspective, I guess, um, but also to give you some updates on things that are happening. So this thing we call the spirit of Binnaburra is very anchored here at the Lamington National Park. The current status of the National Park on the Binnaburra side of Lamington National Park is the close is still, the park is still closed due to wildfire. Most of the tracks actually are okay to be used, but because of issues with road and access and coordinating with Binnaburra, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife, main roads, um, at this stage, there's still no access to the general public to the Binnaburra side of the park, but, but that will come. Um, for those of you who, are, who like to get out and enjoy national parks here in Queensland, um, the national parks have got on their website, they've got the most recent information, particularly in relation to COVID. Um, when, the, when the media talks about national parks opening up in Queensland, um, that's, that's happening, uh, but not the Binnaburra side. So every weekend we get cars still trying to come up and get into the Binnaburra side of Lamington National Park and, and get very disappointed when they see there's a roadblock with transport and main roads turning people back. So keeping updated on the website of QPWS is quite useful for you or your colleagues who might be looking at enjoying Queensland's national parks uh, for the rest of this year. This concept of the spirit of Binnaburra is, you know, this, this, in this why it's embedded into the national park system in, in, uh, in Australia, actually, and in Queensland, um, deserves us to be aware of the history of the development of national parks and also how Lamington came about and where the land came from. I, I um, wanted to bring to attention George Rankin, uh, who took up the selection here in... Some records say 1911, some records say 1913. Still got to work on that one a little bit. Um, and 13 years before Binnaburra actually started and they got the land, Romeo Lay did try to buy the land from old George Rankin. The photograph down the bottom right of this slide is young George Rankin. Sadly, George Jr. passed away just last year. Wonderful local uh, man. And he was our guest of honour when we had the 85th birthday lunch for Binnaburra a couple of years ago. Um, with George passing, um, the family offered to us at Binnaburra George's table and a little duchess you see there with the mirror. That table, those two pieces of furniture were owned by his dad. And it's highly likely that that table was the table that George Rankin Sr. signed the contracts on that Binnaburra land was purchased on. Um, one of our wonderful FOBS members has now got those two pieces of furniture out of his place near Boona and is polishing them up. And because we'd lost all our wonderful um, uh, old furniture in the fire, these will be two pieces of connection back to the land and the place of Romeo Leahy. Um, but, you know, they, it's a really interesting history uh, we all know about Binnaburra from what what people achieved between two world wars and in the middle of a depression to have this vision for the uh, for the park now our records of course were kept in a fireproof safe um, we had five safes three small ones a med medium sized one and a big one and the big one we finally were able to open just in the last few weeks and very pleasantly surprised to see that about three quarters odd of the archive have survived. They're now in secure uh, airtight boxes, um, and the uh, and there's some examples there of the quality of the paper that, or some of those the, the material that survived. What happens in the fire is a lot of moisture comes out of the uh, archives, and so we're in contact with uh, heritage, cultural heritage. Um, 
Queensland Government and also their archaeologists, and they're giving us advice on the best way to care for this in terms of the way we handle it and the way that um, we can digitalize it also. So the future records are also in digital form as well as in the hard, hard form. Um, and over the next few months, we'll be working with those of our shareholders who are really interested in the archives and the history, um, who want to contribute and help, um, will facilitate an opportunity for them to come and see what survived and, and how we can um, uh, keep those records and add to them with the new history of Binnaburra since the fire. So these people that we hear about so much, who did so much for establishing national parks in Queensland and for establishing Binnaburra and providing access to national parks, like Robbie, Robert Collins and Ramon Leahy and Arthur Groom, they're, they're, the, they're superstars in the history of Binnaburra. Um, and we, we, uh, we recognize and always um, value the work that they, they made to the organization. But what's happened also after over 80 or 90 years is that many other people have done incredible things for this organization. And one of them, um, I've been doing a bit of homework on this in the last few years, and I'll just an example of uh, David Kroll, who was the chairman of the board back in 1938. Like Ramea Leahy, served in the First World War, served in the Second World War also, um, and was a eminent medical doctor in, a, in, in Queensland. Um, and many of his contemporaries who were associated with Binnaburra were very highly educated and professional people. Ted Marks is an example of one, a metallurgist and a geologist who, who then went and studied medicine. Um, and his, his story and his connection to Binnaburra is quite significant also. And these names pop up in the books and the writings of people like Arthur Groom quite regularly. Fred uh, Basil Roberts, um, who worked with Romeo Leahy and Arthur Groom back in the 1930s, is another example. He went off to the Second World War. I'm not sure if Marilyn's with us this morning, but she lives in the UK. She's a shareholder and she contacted me back in March um, and about her Binnabara story. And it was just a wonderful story. So in your, for those of you who are with us today, um, if, you, if you have stories of family uh, that connected with Binnabara, please send them to me because I'm putting together a series of this simple little um, connections of people um, throughout the 90, 80 or 90 years of Binnaburra. So it's always, and it could be the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and so on. It's really good. A more recent one, as an example, is Bill and Margie Richer. I'm not sure if they're with us here today on the, on the Zoom, but um, they, had, they, they made the effort to attend a uh, shareholder consultation process late last year when we were looking at new plans for Binnaburra. And you know, they've got a uh, generational linkage with Bill's dad, who worked for Romeo Leahy. And then Bill and Margie have been longtime supporters and supporters of Binnaburra and, and the FOBs. And, and also served the country uh, with his, with his um, service in the Vietnam War. And then we've got these intergenerational linkages. And this is one uh, photo shared with, by Richard Groom from uh, 35 odd years ago when with Lucy and his son Stuart um, were photographed there on um, the, the trail below where the dining room was. And then they came back in October last year and we took photographs in the same locations. You'll notice in that middle shot where Sue and Lucy are standing, the wheelbarrow there with the plastic wheelbarrow in the middle of frame. That's actually, that was there, that survived the bushfire. The bushfire came up to the lodge and somehow went around that particular uh, wheelbarrow, and it, it, it's a survivor of the bushfires. And then there's new history. I was up at the lodge this morning, and uh, these three guys, wonderful, wonderful young guys, they volunteered to repaint the tea house and the um, uh, toilet facilities in the campground. And, and so Binnaburra gave them a box of beer each this morning to thank them for their volunteer work. But this is the example. They're not shareholders, but they're very connected to Binnaburra. They involved, well, I think, with Dulux Paints and they were having a meeting at Binnaburra before the fires. They saw what happened to the fires. 
Dulux very kindly um, donated the paint and these guys have volunteered their, their service to do the repainting. And they're part of the story, the modern story of Binnabarra, especially our post-fire story of Binnabarra where people have been just so remarkable wanting to reach out and assist us. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of stories such as this. Okay, let me now move on to the third part uh, about recalling the bushfire. Um, so we know here in Australia that bushfires are part of this continent. Uh, however, last the season last year was um, and the bushfire commission started a few days ago, and so we're getting lots of information coming out of uh, the commission also now about the extent of the damage. We were very fortunate that we had no loss of life um, at Binnaburra uh, because of good decision making, good preparation, um, and 34 odd people unfortunately were killed in Australia during the bushfires. The commission that's on right now reported in the news just in the last few days that more than another 400 people died because of smoke related illnesses that came because more than 50% of the Australian population actually were impacted by bushfire smoke. So we lost 11 homes in the Beachmont Binnabarra area and, and, and there was 3000 odd homes lost around Australia and over a billion animals as the research is coming from some of the people looking at that uh, area of the impact on the ecology and the biodiversity. It's, and it's estimated about a third of the Australian koala population was, was devastated. So in our part of Australia, we're at the front end of, the, of a national bushfire um, event. And we started to be alerted in August, a month or so before bushfires actually hit Binnaburra with hazard reduction burns just across the road from my house, just down the road from Binnaburra, uh, working with the Beachmont Rural Fire Brigade and, um, uh, and QPWS. And you'll see the photograph on the right hand side there that was taken uh, four weeks before the fires hit um, Binnaburra. But that was, that was hazard reduction burns that were occurring uh, at that time. Then f five days before the fire that got to Beach One and Binnaburra arrived, there, there was evidence of a, of a, a growing fire down at Sarabar, down towards Canungra. Um, and that was being tracked five days out, four days out, three days out, and so forth as the wind was coming up. Um, whilst there was an incredible amount of effort to try and save Binnaburra, it was not possible with the tsunami of flames that came through. This photograph was taken uh, probably on the Sunday afternoon or the Monday of the fire. The fire was on a Sunday because you can see the sky lodge is damaged there in that first um, uh, building. And but we had on the Saturday and the Sunday of the fire, we had massive amount of aerial uh, water bombing going on because the fire was threatening to go down the number of Bar Valley and up to Springbrook, and they really wanted to cut it off at Binnaburra. Um, and the amount of aerial bombing that occurred was quite remarkable for a couple of days. But sadly, we lost the lodge, the core part of the lodge, and had damaged in other areas. And then a few months later, um, after the police investigation came through, we were alerted to the fact that the cause of the fire was discarded cigarette butts from two teenagers um, who have not been charged, um, and that the police report. Um, was interesting to receive, but that was the cause of the fire, um, that, that cigarette parts. So our, in Australia, the, uh, with our Gondwana World Heritage Area, um, you see, just a reminder that we're in Queensland, we're a small part of the big World Heritage Area, and the fires went from us from the top to the bottom, and that a, more than half of the Gondwana World Heritage Areas were burnt um, and it was more severe of course in the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area too. So as we as we go forward with Binnabara and we talk about the bushfire and we have events, one of our signature events we're looking at is called the Gondwanda Festival and it's about the Gondwanda rainforest, not just about us in Leamington, um, but we'll partner with Gondwanda players and um, and, sh and do things to make people aware of the impacts of the fire and what and the causes and what exacerbated the fire. 
in, in including issues like climate change. From the Queensland component um, on the Gondwanda, you'll see Lamington National Park, uh, about 10% of Lamington National Park was affected by the fires. Most of that was on the Binnaburra side, on our side. Uh, you'll see Main Range National Park, 68% got big, big hit in the fires. They had a, they had a terrible time after us. Um, and then there were other parts also. So the, um, sadly, we, we're not alone in terms of communities in the Gondwanda area and in southeast Queensland being impacted by, by the fires. But now things are moving along. Um, just to give a couple of shots of work going on, this is Sky Lodges, and, and Tim will talk about the, uh, the, the uh, progress on all the infrastructure and the planning when he comes in, uh, on later. Uh, this, is a, <clears throat> this is a shot from a few weeks ago, and you'll see the work is well underway um, on the Sky Lodges. They'll be ready for uh, customer use by the end of July, and we'll talk more about that timing shortly. Um, the campground, the guy's done a fantastic job, still doing a fantastic job, making all the safari tents and, uh, modernised and cleaned up, and new, and the, and the uh, retaining walls and the, uh, the vegetation, the, the small shrubs, which are uh, drought tolerant and fire tolerant. Um, just, it's going to look great. It's looking great already. It's, it's going to look really great by the time we get it open. So... Things are happening really well there in the campground uh, with the permanent tents and the campground itself. And then and Groom's Cottage got through the fire and um, that facility will be, a, because it's a very um, visual when you come into Binnaburra, it's iconic and it's part of the remaining infrastructure that we have in terms of a heritage listing. Um, will make that more of a heritage history type experience than it has been before for our day guests and also for our overnight guests. And um, that young man you see there walking up towards the um, groom's cottage, he's, he's a man of vision and we're looking forward to uh, seeing some of Jonathan's creativity and skills applied to having to for us to be stewards of these place and these buildings, but also to present them in a way that people can enjoy and learn about the spirit of Binnaburra as we, as we go ahead for the next 80 or 90 years. Um, <clears throat> we lost a lot of all, I mean, we lost you know, heaps of stuff in the fire, of course, um, and it costs a lot of money to replace things. So this mower is a $20,000 replacement. Um, and that's just an example of the things you have, we have to do, we have to find. Um, and to maintain the property, um, but it all comes with a cost. So keeping a really close eye on where the, what's very scarce resources we've got financially and where they go is, is super important. But Mr. Paul, the garden, the uh, groundsman was extremely happy back in March when his new, when his new ride on arrived. Let me just quickly go through our biggest single challenge has been since the fire is the wonderful road in the single access road into Binnaburra. And <clears throat> when this road was completed in 1947, up until then, the guests used to, the baggage used to go up in the Flying Fox up the hill there, and people used to use the old goat trail to get up to the lodge. Um, one of the best decisions in the history of Binnaburra was in 1951, was giving that road to the Queensland government. Um, because while there's no published figure on the road repairs now, it's got to be well, in, well past the $20 million mark. So I'm very, very, I think all of us are very, very happy that. 1951 that road was given away to somebody else especially the state government this is what the road looked like just after the fire on the sunday and the tr trees coming down the rocks coming down made a very unstable cliff faces above and below the road and caused damage to the road itself i first got up there on the tuesday after the fire this is when i was coming out with police escort and the fire commissioner um, and they had put that cleared the rocks off the road for us to have a look and we could see the damage that was that had occurred there and then main roads really quickly got in and started work to clear the site get the heavy equipment in um, and it was a massive job for them to do this because up on the cliff side there on the right hand side some very large boulders very unstable sky lodges on the other uh, tony groom's property and 
uh, Noel and Trisha's property, the old manager's house. Um, so a very precarious situation. We were having rock slides continuously for many months. Um, and then the TMR brought in their contractors also. And some of the most amazing workers are these abseilers, a couple of dozen people for months and months on end, hanging off the sides of the rocks um, and the snakes, um, all sorts of interesting things. These people do an incredible job uh, scaling back the loosened rock above and below the road. The main roads have been working day and night for many, many months um, and to stabilize the slopes above and below the road. And that work is still continuing now. This was just before, before Christmas in November, part of the process of stabilization on the slope. This was just before Christmas, the work was still going on. Uh, that was just before Christmas, what the road looked like. Uh, January started to, to um, they put some foundations in to make the road wider and safer. And then in January, in the second half of January and early Feb, we had a big bunch of rain. And that was lovely because that was actually the first time that I felt that, yes, the bushfire season's over. We were still having spot fires at Binnabara in early January. <clears throat> So September, October, November, December, January, four to five months after the main fire, fire was still a problem. And even after the main fire, a month or two after, remaining assets of Binnaburra were saved by volunteer Beachmont Rural firefighters on patrols when fires started to pop up again, when wind came up and there was still fire inside logs and under the ground. However, this rain, as welcome as it was, did set back the roadworks um, uh, considerably, a number of weeks and that had to be factored into our planning also. Anyway, we get up to May now, and these are a couple of photographs I've taken just in recently, um, in the last few days, about how to show you what the road looks like now. And you can see that it's very advanced in the stabilization of the cliff sides, and the quality of the work that they're putting in is, is substantial um, and wonderful. And this morning I was up at the lodge and this is a photo I took of the road just this morning. This is a windy corner coming down out of the lodge. And you'll see um, the, how, how great the condition that road's looking now as of this morning. This is from this morning also. You'll see the drainage on the left. Uh, the guardrails are going in on the right hand side down and that's very impressive. The new guardrail system all the way down. And this is another shot from this morning. Uh, when the crews were just coming back on work this morning. You'll see the guardrails here from this photograph I took this morning. As on the road, when it's reopened, there's still a couple of places where it'll be single cars going through, and then there's pull-out bays like this one here, an example that people will be able to pull over to when they're coming up or down the, the, um, to the lodge. Okay, so the impact on the business. Um, in September, we evacuated on the Friday, um, the team on, on, at, the, at the time uh, made a good decision to get everybody and the staff and guests out before uh, a few hours before the wind has started to bring down trees and the rock falls on the road and cut the road access. Um, but we've had no guests and no trading activities apart from a little bit of work at the tea, at, down at the headmaster's cafe for many, many months. So nine months of no trading and that's not good for any business. That's hard. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to restart some trading when the road becomes available to us in late July. The key thing from the board's point of view is to ensure the company remains solvent, that we don't have to put call in uh, somebody else, like receivers or somebody. And so far, we've been able to do that. And that happens because of incredible people who um, all come together to keep this thing, this company alive and uh, and and deal with the all the issues that we have to deal with in terms of conserving our very scarce financial resources and attracting other resources and we'll talk about that shortly and in particular arabond um, and our cfo michelle just remarkable lady in terms of her talents and crunching the numbers and rob mcdowell who's a former chairman i took over from rob a couple of years ago uh, who's come back as company secretary, their contributions are just wonderful and remarkable. 
Um, and Hal Morris, who was chairman before Rob, has uh, kindly offered to come back on the board. Um, and my approach has been where, where you could have the media past chairman and the chairman before that, you're going back 12 or 15 years, it's an enormous amount of knowledge and understanding about the culture and the spirit of Minabara and the realities of the business. And having to harness that, that experience is just wonderful. But there's many other people too. So it's not just them, but that's been the great thing about the spirit of Benabara is that when we've been hit, got a good slap around the ears that we've been able to bring together. Um, and those people who want to see Benabara get back on its feet. So the impact on the business, um, we've got, we've been very fortunate and um, I want to thank Tim Medhurst in particular for his incredible efforts in this area. Um, we've been able as an organisation to secure National Bushfire Recovery Agency funding to the tune of one, over 1.7 million. It's designated for the clean up and the recovery and the land stabilisation, especially over at the Bellbird Lookout where the Via Ferrata developments is going and Tim will mention that later and also for master planning. The Friday before the fire, the, Friday, the fire was on Sunday the 8th of September. On Friday the 6th, we got a, an email, a letter from the Queensland government, a confidential one, to say that we'd been awarded the initial grant of $1.48 million for the new adventure activity called Via Ferrata, which is cliff, cliffside climbing. And then there was additional funds required, so we've got over $1.6 million there. And then for the proposed Gondwanda Festival, we've been awarded a total from different sources, 75,000. So we've got three and a half million dollars um, of public funds that the company's responsible for managing. Um, and we've got processes and systems and people in place to do that. So we've had incredible support from government, local, state and federal, of which we're enormously appreciative of. But that also highlights how significant Binabara is in the psyche of the public through government that we get this level of support. And yes, we're looking for more too, if we can. We're not greedy, but we need to, we need to get the help as we can, whenever we can find it. I'm going to hand across to Tim now, and Tim's gonna walk. Tim, I'll, I'll, I've got the slides. I'll just, you just tell me to click a slide and I'll just move on when you're ready. Can, can you hear me, Tim? Yep, I can hear you okay, that's great. Right. I'll start with that one. And you just tell me the next slide when you're ready. Thanks, Tim. Okay, thanks Steve, and nice to see everybody's faces there. Um, Steve's given, as usual, a fantastic background and update. And as always, Steve has a great set of slides and images. Um, I don't have those yet for you, because we're still, a lot of it is in the planning and the organising stage. Um, so I've got a couple of slides I can give you an update on where we're up to. Um, but with Jonathan coming in next Tuesday, there'll be some changes to that as well. So by the time we get uh, to the next meeting in July, we will have a lot more images and things to show you. However, if we start at this one, um, obviously the pink on this map shows you the area that was burnt. I think most many people have seen a version of this. As we know, the fire came from the top of the page, came from the north, uh, went around, effectively around the sky lodges, up to the main lodge, and continued up towards the campground. Um, the water bombing on that Sunday morning helped protect the pot shed and the barn, who only had sort of minor damage. Um, and also helped obviously protect the uh, campground up the top. The fires we didn't know at that stage also continued around to the cliff face of Bellbird Clearing and the area we had planned or have planned for the Via Ferrata um, was also burnt, but I'll come back to that. In terms of overall plans and where we're heading, I can sort of break it down into four areas. Um, one is the top of the hill, the old Binnaburra Lodge site, Mount Roberts, where we lost the lodge, the dining room, and the 42 cabins. Because of the road issues with access, we haven't been able to get any demo trucks up there until last week. And in our negotiations with TMR, and we have you know, daily, <laughs> daily, almost hourly discussions with them on various access things. Um, they have effectively given us a two week window to get in and do the demolition work. So Ian's been overseeing that relationship and working with the demolition company we started last week. It's probably going to take longer than two weeks, but somewhere within about a four week period, um, we'd look to have the whole top of the hill and all the things that need to go be gone. Um, the site had asbestos, so that initially there was asbestos reports, both on the ground and air quality done. 
um, and a fair bit of the, the site has asbestos and so that will be um, you know, taken off and dealt with appropriately. When it's finished, what we're looking to do is at this stage to regrass the site so that we have a, a big open area up there that can be used for functions and events and that people can basically wander up there whilst we're still designing and replanning what goes back up there. Um, so that's sort of that area. If I go to the Sky Lodges... Um, oh, sorry, Jim. No, sorry, just go back to that plan if I can, Steve. Whoop. Back one. That one? Um, yep, thank you. So the Sky Lodges, as I say, is per Steve's photo, effectively, because they were only built 10 years ago and they were designed for a bushfire-prone area with core fill concrete and the, fly, um, the screens and the clearing, sprinklers, all the things that, that effectively worked. Um, they were fairly, basically unaffected. Um, the staff did a great job before, um, as the fires came and went and closed all the screens, which, which made a big difference, and the doors and the windows. Um, and so the only impact really on the Sky Lodges was that eastern one, which neighbours onto Tony's land. And as um, we didn't own that land, we, the Sky Lodges hadn't been able to clear it. And so it actually jumped across from Tony's land to the eastern edge of the eastern building, went up to the top level and burnt out the two unit, two bedroom unit at the top. Interestingly, if you walked into the one bedroom studio beside it, um, it looked unaffected. So the internal fire rated walls and roof and all the systems actually worked. So at that stage, September, October, by the time we had insurance up there, um, resolved what needed to be done. We sort of November got contract signed in December, um, had builders on site start of January. They were on there for a week. And then that rain that Steve mentioned came and two things happened. One was um, because one of the abseilers had been on the site um, was abseiling after the rain and uh, unfortunately a tree that he was tied onto pulled down to the ground and dragged him 60 metres down the hill. They end up closing the whole road to everybody, including us, for about a six, five to six week period whilst they went through and assessed every tree and did more work they call scaling um, with the rocks and the trees. Unfortunately, during that period, we got more rain and because the roof of the top of that Lodge 4 was gone, um, the water, the, the vents in the building for the you know, service pipes and things meant water got down into the next two levels. So what started off as just a rebuild of the top of Lodge 4 effectively now is a rebuild of everything inside Lodge 4. So over the next month or two, everything was taken out, the furniture, the walls, the carpets. Um, it's been defumigated and um, all the moisture process is done. At this stage, they're up to rebuilding the top of level um, Lodge 4. And the plan is, um, by the current schedule, that the whole of the Sky Lodges will be rebuilt um, around mid-July. I think Steve will come to later is around the same time that TMR are looking to uh, formally open the road. So by the July, end of, mid, middle end of July, Sky Lodges will be open. Um, one of the good things, positive that came out of it, is that because the buildings have been sat there for so long, even Lodges 1, 2 and 3, which effectively hadn't been impacted apart from some smoke damage, because of the combination of the smell of the smoke and the moisture that had got inside, during those rain events without being cleaned over the next well, it's been seven or eight months now, the cleaners and the insurance company have agreed that we can have effectively replace a lot of the furniture that is inside the Sky Lodges. So that means new beds, um, a lot of new furniture inside, which for the Sky Lodge owners um, and for Binnaburra, as they own half the ff &E, the Furniture Fittings and Equipment Fund, is a great thing because it's almost like a revamp of the furniture inside. So again, we're hoping to get all that done. And part of my reason for not having a whole lot of slides is yesterday I was picking out colours and sorting out a whole lot of furniture details to get that ordered in so it's, everything's ready to go by July. Um, we've got landscapers redoing the grounds and the gardens of the Sky Lodges. And Tony's agreed that um, we can clear that 20 metres to the east of the Sky Lodge um, on that eastern one, and that's been cleared. So short answer is come July, um, Binnaburra Sky Lodges are open and ready for, for occupation. The other area if I go to, I should mention at the same time, so Tony's building next door and Trisha's the next one, they're also being cleared this, um, these next two, three, 
two to three weeks. So, uh, and they'll look at rebuilding after that. We move to the east, we've got the Via Ferrata project. Maybe we can go to the next slide now, Steve. Um, which some of you again will have seen. We've been working on for a year or two before the fires. In the nine months before, um, we've been working with the government on that grant application that got approved on the day of the fires. Uh, this is a new activity, and I think most of you know what it is. Um, I've seen pictures before. But in terms of what it means for us and the funding we've got, the funding allows us to firstly put in about 30 more car parks. It allows us to pave the road from the um, windy corner where the rubbish bins used to be down to the old uh, maintenance shed, which also got burnt and it's going, um, where we'll build a, a new training um, admin building. And then people would start their Via Friday activity from there. They'd walk along the track down to the uh, Bellberg clearing and the um, where the 90 meter abseil is. Uh, there's a few activities they'll be doing. There's two or three designs that aren't shown in here, but effectively they work, work their way across the cliff. There's a Burma bridge and maybe one other activity across the front of um, Bellbird Falls. And then they either come up, back up and into the um, shed or they can tend their way right around the cliff and back up to the, um, back up to the kiosk building. It's, it can be anything from a two hour to a four hour sort of activity, um, but we think that's going to be pretty attractive for either day trippers and or people staying. And we think that's going to be a pretty important part of um, the borough's future, certainly future income. Go to the next slide, Steve, please. So for those who hadn't seen it, that's a side on view looking at the cliff. The great thing is that, <clears throat> as you may be aware, this will be the first commercial Via Ferrata in Australia. So whilst there's thousands of them in Europe, hundreds across North America, um, there's two in New Zealand, this will actually be the first one in Australia. And one of the reasons we're able to do it is that all that cliff face is all on Binnaburra land. So whilst we have national parks below us and all around us, um, which are obviously far more of an issue to build, um, all this land is ours. One of the realities is, um, we can go to the next slide please, Steve. is during the fires, I say the fire actually came around our um, cliff face and has burnt all that out. So we weren't able to start building straight away and we still aren't until we do an equivalent job to what the um, TMR guys have done on the cliff above the road at Binnaburra. We need to do a similar job on this cliff face to clear the rocks and the trees where we're gonna build a Via Ferrata. And that's a large part of what that second lot of funding came for. And that's going to take an equivalent sort of period of time so at this stage, we're looking at um, the Via Frata probably not being ready until June next year. Um, it's, it's gonna be quite a long process. If we can get it earlier, that'll be great, but there's a lot of work to make the cliff safe given that the fires have been there. Um, but that, all that work will be continuing on. One of the impacts of that is one of the tracks that isn't open at the moment is the Lower Bellbird track, and national parks are leaving that until their last one to work on. So it's likely the lower Bellbird track will be closed until the Via Ferrata is open because we'll be working above it during that time period. Um, move ahead again, Steve, please. Uh, just as a quick update, uh, the building we're looking at putting down where the old maintenance shed was has a, um, a covered area, a briefing room where people would come in and uh, get their gear, learn how to sort of put it on, what they're going to be doing there's an office and a store and a big deck that'll look have a beautiful view. As we know, that was the old shed with the view. Well, it really will have a great view now. Um, go to the next one, please, Steve. That gives you a bit of an idea of what the architect currently has planned. Um, you can see the deck on the bottom left-hand photo, the bottom right-hand photo. You can see that where we have the, effectively a toilet shower, we're building a climbing wall over that, and that's where having got their harnesses and gear on, the people would be doing the Via Ferrata would come out and use this as a practice. They'll um, climbing up over there and sailing down and practicing on there before they walk down and physically do the whole lot. So next slide, please, Steve. Um, that's probably the third area and the last area. Uh, yes, we will have a water tank to collect water is the short answer. Um, the last area is then the, the um, 
campsite, top of the hill, groom's cottage area. And as Steve mentioned, Leanne and others have been working up there basically for the last six months, replacing safari tents, putting roofs on safari tents. Um, we're putting power to what we've called the powered sites before, but haven't had power and water. Um, campground, uh, Steve said a lot of revegetation work's gone on. That's been happening. At the same time, we're trying to work out what the plan is, um, I guess, with the tea house, because effectively for a while, it's going to be sort of where people will gather and congregate. And so we've been looking at plans for how we'd remodel that right at the moment. Even the look and the feel has changed, given that Dulux have been up and repainted it. And as you'll see when you get up there, it's quite a different look and feel. We'll have some of those photos at the next presentation. Um, what's been great is having Jonathan coming in and already starting before he officially starts with some of the ideas and some of the thoughts on what we can do with Groom's Cottage, what we can do with the barn area. And I think it's going to be a pretty exciting outcome when we get to that. Steve, do you want me to talk any more about that or let Jonathan talk about that or save that for later? While Steve's thinking, one of the things I will mention is that, as I think you're all aware that um, immediately after the fire, we, the government set up the task force. And in that six months that we met with them regularly, they could not have been more helpful and more supportive. And one of the great outcomes is, and from a planning point of view, which is important as we move ahead, that whole top of the hill where we lost the lodge and the cabins, normally if we were going to rebuild, we'd have to go through a, a DA process, a development application, um, which could take minimum nine months, generally 18 months. Um, for example, the Sky Lodge process was a 12 month process of getting the DA and cost some $800,000. Um, and it would be at least that, if not more, for us to get a DA to rebuild. What we've been able to negotiate is what they call a like for like. And they've effectively said to us, both the state level and the council level, that the GFA, the gross floor area that we've lost, which is around three and a half thousand square meters, we can rebuild all of that, generally in accordance with what we've had before, not the layout, but just the similar sort of facilities that we had um, without any new development approvals. We'll still need to get building approvals so that the building form fits all the current guidelines, both for fire, for everything that is a current guideline. But in terms of the development approval, in terms of what you'd normally need to do before you can even get to the building approval, we've short-circuited that by 12 to 18 months and saved ourselves a million dollars, which has been a great support from both the, the government and the council. Uh, allows us to now effectively get in and master plan what we, we do want to do in that area. And then as Steve said, the next part is to find the funding. Steve, thoughts on the campground area? Do you just want to leave that at the moment? Uh, and, yeah, I'll leave that when uh, I've got a uh, roadmap coming up, Tim, and I'll, okay. get, I'll ask Jonathan to comment on that at that time. So my apologies, no more pictures. Next one, we'll have more finished things to show people. I hope to answer any questions or if you want to keep moving, Steve. Yeah, we'll come we'll do the next session and then we'll do Q&A. Yep. Thanks, that's great. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so uh, next steps for Benabara. And Jonathan, Jonathan, can you hear me at all? Can we unmute Jonathan? Uh, yes, I can, Steve, thank you. Jonathan, would you be kind enough just to perhaps walk through this schedule, just briefly? Are you okay with that? Yeah, no, I'll be okay with that. And uh, may I begin by paying tribute to our chairman and to Tim and, and all, the, all the staff and volunteers that have been doing such a great job uh, before, during and after the fire and uh, I, I can only guess at the impact that you've had to deal with them. Um, but moving forward to the future now, it's a great honour to be in the position that I have been offered or about to be. Um, what ahead of you is a roadmap uh, subject to access and, and careful management of the funding. Um, we are dealing not only with the obviously the impact of the fire, but also the impact of COVID-19 and the uncertainty about uh, restrictions opening up of the market. What we are all confident of, I think, is that uh, Binabar as a, an attraction um, will be very strongly in demand and we have to be careful about how we manage our limited assets uh, to be able to respect the spirit of the place that Steve talked about. 
So this is a stage process, starting with the re reopening of Binabara Kitchen at the old school site, which requires delicate um, negotiations with the local community and in due course, Scenic Rim Council that own that site. Binabara uh, has an opportunity for itself, but more importantly, for the community as a whole to provide a facility which respects that it's a community owned site. So we, we have to make sure that we get that right. Um, we've been able to uh, get permission um, to extend the covered seating area and open up more of a view in the old school covered area. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we'll put in a small general store, if you like, which has not been functioning up here on the Beachmont community for some time to give both a facility uh, for the residents, but in due course for the visitors to a bit of our, whether it be sky lodges or campground and so on, to pick up some basic provisions and so on before and after they arrive. Um, and it will become, as an information point, not only to Beachmore, but to the plateau as a whole and the connection down to Canungra. So it, it, we're providing a, 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 a service to the community, but it, it's also an important gateway to Benavar itself. So we need to put in uh, the staffing again that are going to go focus on that and some improvements to that building before it opens uh, early July. Hopefully by then the restrictions will be lifted enough to make that a viable operation because nothing we can do can we can afford to do at a loss. We just don't have that capacity to, to fund loss making staff. End of July, as Steve said, the official opening of, of the, the road uh, and tributes uh, to uh, TMR in particular and the support from state government, which has been fantastic. And hopefully by then the Sky Lodges will be available for booking. Um, and there'll be a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure on, on the site. People want to come up and, and do the right thing and support it. They will also want to come up and see what's left and we need to manage that process. We know we're at the end of the road and the demand needs to be managed um, and people need to be given a good experience. Um, early August, uh, we hope that Grimm's Cottage will be opened up and there was, there is, there's been some significant changes there. Um, the idea is that Grimm's Cottage effectively becomes the heritage hub, becomes the, 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 the heart of, of, of the place. Um, and, and you can see on the slide here that the idea is that upstairs becomes the, the library and the reading room that has been lost from the lodge itself. Um, and downstairs is more of a facility for uh, in due course, you know, guests uh, and, uh, and the like to come and have a, a late afternoon drink, get together, uh, sit around the fire and reminisce about the great walks that they've had and so on and so forth. But, so it will become more of the, the heritage hub of the place. We hope that it will be open to shareholders for information and engagement, Sky Lodge holders in, in August. Uh, we, we won't have the tea house open to the general public in August. There'll be a lot of work been going on uh, in that area to, to improve it further. Um, we know that, that uh, the, the general visitors and even the, uh, the Sky Lodge people would, would enjoy having some sort of takeaway facility, food, coffee facility. Um, and at the moment, it's likely to be a food van, although we were talking with the staff yesterday about the idea of, of adapting uh, part of the tea house for takeaway facility, more that I need to talk about with Tim Jonai before the next briefing session. Moving into September, by that stage, um, the, the tea house, I hope, will have been um, remodeled at, at, at the upper level. And you can see there, we're talking about that being the main reception area for people booking in for the campsite, uh, a new retail area, and hopefully an extended deck area as well to really take into account the magnificent views that are going from that site down all the way down to the Gold Coast, uh, but also to cater for the extended demand that we think is there. Underneath that uh, tea house will be some amenities really targeting the safari tent, um, uh, now that they have been uh, modernized, uh, improved, uh, then it would be lovely to have some a better uh, um, uh, shower and toilet facilities uh, for the safari tents and it just all spreads the demand that we're expecting. Um, so uh, by September, uh, the campground, uh, the tea house uh, and, uh, uh, and the rest of the site was really ready to be fully open. Um, 
get it hopefully in time for the school holidays. So we're now into October. Um, moving on into November is the shareholders week. Uh, important to get the support of the shareholders and for the chair and the board to, um, to put to the shareholders what the future of the company might be. And then finally, um, in December, um, one of the key changes that we've been discussing over the last month or so is the idea to um, improve the, the current barn and the pot shed um, to provide uh, dormitory accommodation and um, new shower toilet uh, facilities, which allows us to put more of a focus in Groom's Cottage on, uh, on that being a facility open to everybody. So. The idea with the barn is it will provide um, uh, better facilities on the site for the education groups and volunteers and other bits, uh, other other people in, in, that have traditionally enjoyed um, access to the site, and it provides a focal point for the future um, management of uh, the the activities on the site, such as the Via Ferrata and beyond. Um, behind the barn, there is an amazing reclaimed area, if you like. A lot of the fill has gone into the land behind the barn which long term has lots of different possibilities but in the short term if it's stable enough that's more area where we might be able to take up demand for casual camping and so on and so forth particularly if we've got new toilets and showers put up all of that is subject to um, careful management of our cash flows and our funding so um, we have to be a bit careful but it's a very exciting feature where i hope we respect uh, uh, the shareholders, the spirit of the Binnabara, and make, be make best use of the, um, the facilities that were saved are still there. And then we can take our time to carefully look at what is going to be um, done with, uh, with the areas that were sadly lost to the fires. And again, I pay great tribute to the team that have been there already, to Tim Skills, in, in making sure that we got so much help from state government. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jonathan. That's great. So, folks, um, we'll leave any questions to the Q&A session. Um, Tim made reference to the Via Ferrata. Um, so, for those of you who um, are not familiar with it, that's sort of what it looks like. You get all harnessed up and off you go. I'll be doing it. So, come and join me. It'd be great. Looking forward to it. Uh, middle of next year. Um, just also, just a little update. We we have a now Binnabara Science Matters approach, which is, and we have um, two wonderful people co-chairing that. Uh, very distinguished professors in their fields of ecology and tourism management and other things. That's Roger and Diane, and uh, we have a uh, a long-term strategic relationship uh, partnership with Griffith University, um, and that's already start things. There are things happening. Um, below the scenes, I guess, which ultimately in the future will bring business to Binnaburra. Uh, but also not just business, it'll create new knowledge and, and interpretive material, educational resources and so forth. So that, that's that been held back a little bit with COVID. The universities are all grappling with their own survival, but, um, but, but, but there's still things happening in relation to various programs with Griffith University and other, other universities also. I'll just flag this one. Um, won't go into too much detail, but the, we did we did incorporate um, the Binnaburra Foundation Limited, and it's a it's uh, and its purpose and its relationship with Binnaburra Lodge Limited is something that we need to go through a stake a shareholder consultation process with, and that's when Jonathan comes online. That'll free my time up a bit more to focus on this particular very significant strategic direction for the company. Um, and the foundation is established to be a charity. Currently, it's a, uh, it's a company under the the, the um, Australian um, ATSIC, I think I say the right one, Australian Securities Investment Commission, ASIC, um, as a company, a not-for-profit company. There's another stage with the National Charities Commission, Not-for-Profits Commission, where you go into charity status. That's work in progress, but we're just, we're just at stage one right now. But the foundation, um, its purpose, is to enhance the natural environment and cultural heritage by providing gateway to Lamington National Park, offering a range of sustainable accommodation, activities, experiences, education, and research opportunities, and conserving and improving the heritage listed land and buildings of which we are a custodian. I envisage that when, and when we do the next of these Zoom um, 
connections that will take the opportunity to present some early ideas about the foundation and its relationship with Binnaburra Lodge Limited and start to get um, shareholder views on some of the ideas that we can advance this with. Um, some people have asked me about what happened to their chairs with their family names on. Sadly, they all got destroyed in the fire. But there seems to be a lot of interest in having chair holders back again. So that's a, um, uh, Joe Weir sent me a photograph a few days ago that she had um, from home. And I think Joe and Keith are past the stage of doing chairs again. So anyway, we'll look at that in the planning of how we might be able to have chairholder concept come back in. At this stage, we've got nowhere to put chairs um, like that, but in the future we may have, but that's something that we'll be keeping on the radar as we go forward for those of you who are interested in your chairholders status. And let's now go to a Q&A session. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start with the first question from Heather. About, is there a sign at the roundabout saying the Binnaburra section is closed? Yes, there is a sign still there at the roundabout indicating the Binnaburra is closed. Um, and, uh, Corrine, do you, will you have water tank to collect rainwater? Corrine, we have, we have a very good water supply from up in the park in an arrangement with QPWS. Um, Tim, do you want to comment on the issue of the need for water tanks or not at Binnaburra? Um, yeah. I think the question actually was just relating specifically to the Via Ferrata building, Steve, when we were talking okay. about that. Yeah, and yes, okay. we will have one down there. And that'll, yeah, that's the short answer. So unrelated to the main water supply. Yeah. Uh, and Corinne, we also, with the Sky Lodges pro development, there's a very large water tank underneath the car park there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's good. That's good. I was just wondering whether in the master plan, it was also planned to have a a uh, full water system that could maybe run a bit more all around um, the Binabura, you know, surfaces so that if there were another fire coming, actually some of the water could be used, um, you know, to protect a bit or to have, um, I don't know, like a system that would target some buildings specifically and to have something around to protect them. Yeah. So in the old um, facility, uh, Karin, the, um, there was a watering system around and it was turned on when the fire was on, but it just wasn't strong enough. Um, but the water, water and access to water for fire mitigation is a very high priority in everything we do now at Binnaburra. Um, so yeah, look, so water access and availability is a critical issue that goes into the planning all the time. And, you know, obviously we're, We've always been, Binnabar has always been sensitive to bushfire danger and it's, we're hypersensitive now about bushfire danger. The bushfires we saw across Australia last year, what's for sure coming out of the commission that's already on, <clears throat> is that they're going to happen again. When they happen again, nobody knows, but it's going to happen again. Will we get a, a similar one at Binnabar in the next 80 or 100 years? Who knows? But we need to be prepared for it if we continue to see the long-term drying out of these subtropical rainforests. Um, Heather, you asked a question about food at the Via Ferrata building. Um, uh, Tim, do you, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, yep, just before I do, maybe just for others to know with the water tanks, as most people will be aware, our water supply comes from about six kilometres into the National Park and is piped to a couple of tanks that are about 500 metres into the National Park. It used to be on Binnaburra land and then treated and then had basically gravity fed down the hill to everywhere. One of the things we're looking at doing is actually getting some new water tanks up at the same site, which would allow us to keep the existing tanks as a backup water supply for fires only. Um, so that's one of the things in the plans. Um, what was the next question, Steve? The... Um, down at the Via Ferrata, a kiosk. Oh what we'll have in terms of some light snacks or coffee or food. The building that's been designed is flexible to do that, but that's probably going to be a decision that's going to be made in conjunction, you know, with Jonathan as to how we end up running it in the future, whether people just finish the activity and head are taken back up to the tea house um, or we can do things down there. But the current plan is that actually go back up to the tea house for, for all those things, but the building's flexible enough. We can do both. Steve, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I'm just going to unmute. 
um, Tim Atherton. So Tim, you're unmuted now. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Leighton, and uh, hello, everyone. Great to see so many familiar faces, and uh, the spirit of Bimaburra lives, as they say. Steve, firstly, just a, a little bit of uh, groveling. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to pay tribute, I'm sure everyone would agree with me, to your leadership as the chairman. Uh, you've been the face of the recovery of Binnabara. I know there's a lot of people behind the scenes doing some fantastic work, but I just want to particularly pay tribute to the excellent leadership that you're showing as our chairman. So, well done. Thank you, Tim. Bit of a background here. Um, I'm just a legal, but my, my legal background coming through. You, uh, you mentioned earlier about the police not charging the two individuals that were involved uh, in the mm -hmm. cigarette butt dropping. My understanding is that that was a negligent rather than a, uh, a deliberate act. And that had implications for us in terms of uh, our potential total insurance payout. Mm -hmm. um, um, and unfortunately, if they had been charged with maliciously setting fire to the, the bush there near the uh, uh, O'Reilly's uh, Canungra vineyards, uh, they probably, we would probably would have got a lot more money out of our insurance coverage. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, Tim. Um, um, the issue with arson um, is that the, you have to prove intent. Yes, it's and, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> it was their intention to burn down Binnaburra. Well, probably not. Five no. or six days before they threw a cigarette butt out. So, mm. um, yeah, we've been through that uh, in some detail. And, um, um, uh, yeah, so after the uh, police report came out, um, that, that sort of, we slowed down a bit on that yep. in terms of our available energy and resources also. Sure. Uh, I didn't want to go into too much detail there, but my understanding was that it was just stupidity on their part rather than deliberate intention to set fire to the forest or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it, yeah. Yep. And uh, as a founder of uh, Fobbs of Binnaburra, of Friends of Binnaburra, I'm really keen to uh, see the Fobbs back up there and giving you a hand. I know they're doing some, some work off-site but uh, really keen to see get get on hands on uh, back up at the lodge when everything gets reopened. So, well, thank you, Tim. And uh, meeting and meeting Jonathan too. Welcome, Jonathan. Yeah, great. Uh, Fobs, yes, Tim. Thanks for mentioning that. An incredibly incredible group of people for so many decades, um, who are dead keen, obviously, to get back um, when we when we can have safe access and have a structured program um, for them to engage. That's fantastic. Um, and, um, and we look forward to a revival of FOBs. I also started a group called MOBS, M-O-B-B-Z, which is Millennials of Binnabara plus Gen Z. And they've got 60 or 70 people who are in their 20s and 30s who are really also passionate about Binnabara and bring some intergenerational thinking in. So over the next six months, we'll get them more engaged also so that we, we can respect and um, further the legacy of us older generations, but we need to also make sure we're building something that the customer in 20, 30, 40 years time wants too. So we're very conscious of this intergenerational um, thinking uh, coming into the design and the activities of the new Binnabara. And I think that's reflected a bit with Via Ferrata. That'll spearhead a new series of outdoor recreation and adventure activities at Binnabara, which will suit the millennials and Gen Zs, the fit people, and those of us who are older and think we're fit. Too. Okay, let me move back to Heather. Um, you asked a question about the campsite not opening earlier. Um, that's largely due to budgets and work, what's required from a work point of view, a work schedule. Um, Luan, are you there? Did you want to comment on that or Tim? Start with Tim and then Lou. Uh, I think it's a broader picture than just the campground. It's the campground, the amenities block and the tea house all tied together. Um, so we're looking at those three being open at the same time. Um, we'd prefer to sort of have that one package all together rather than open a bit, have people around while we're trying to finish work on other things was the, the key criteria, but others may have other comments. So, so I presume the July deadline for the road, et cetera, is actually after the July school holidays anyway, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the, the target is July 20. That could go out a week or so, depending on what's happening. Bit hard to lock it in yet at this point in time it's still two months away so is there work happening on the amenities block in the campground as well yes yeah. heather we're doing all of the um safari tent sites we're working on the drive-in sites and we're also refreshing the um, self campsites as well as um, all of the cooking stations 
um, and then yeah, grooms in there as well. So it's quite a large lot of work. Um, and also the safety and compliance issues. So having a look at retaining walls. Also, there was a lot of damage to the trees from um, the gas tanks exploding, the water bombing. So we're trying to get through those as well while we, we just have an opportunity at this stage to um, just make sure it's really safe when it comes back. So the scope of work, I think, um, you know, we might, when you just hear that we're just working on the campground, it's a little little bit larger than that. So, um, mm -hmm. but there's, it's multiple works at multiple times. So it's really hard to have people kind of in and around that at this stage. It's going to be great to see it all revived. It was looking very yeah. yeah. <laughs> great. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> it's looking good. It, it's we're absolutely doing happy. our best. So we hope everyone's uh, pleasantly surprised when they come up. Thanks, Lou. Tim, when you're not on site, it's a bit hard to imagine how much is going on up there that at the moment, Timbara, where Steve lives, there's a blockage there with um, TMR. From then up to Windy Corner, there's in any day, there's probably 100 TMR, GHD and McIlwain workers on the road with up to 40 or 50 machines working on things. Once you get past there, you've then got our staff and others, eight or 10 up at the tea house. There was, what, eight, 10 from Dulux painting on Monday, Tuesday. There's another 10 people up on top of the hill doing the demo work, so Ian's managing. There's another, you know, anywhere from five to 50 people working on the sky lodges. There's a lot of machines and people that need a lot of coordinating. So at one level, from our point of view, we'd prefer to get in and get as much done as we can before, before the road opens and the general public are back in. We do know that they're looking to have repaved the road effectively from Timbara, the last three kilometres all the way up to our campground that whole section of road will be repaved. And as part of the relationship we've been able to build with TMR, in particular the day that DG came up to visit, they've also offered to repave our section of road from the saddle back up towards the old lodge. As you may recall, that was very potted and sort of damaged. So it looks like we're gonna get that repaved. During the works, as Jonathan mentioned, we've had some of, this, um, some of the fill that they've taken out from the road put in behind the barn to expand that area. We've also had some put into the saddle on TMR land and they're effectively uh, committed to at least another seven and most likely another 30 car parks in that saddle area. That um, obviously is a great thing for us to be able to have more space for people to park. But a lot of relationships we've built with TMR and that fantastic government support we've had all the way through. Thanks, Tim. And then we've also um, had... Um, you know, power and water lines pulled up as well. So um, National Parks and TMR have lent us kindly some of their equipment. So we were able to get the powered sites to run under ground as well. So there's been a lot of compliance and safety work. We've had an electrician up on site um, pretty much full time. So all of those leftover wires and, you know, um, plumbing, everything like that, we've now had tracked um, and we're just replacing where we can. So everything's really nice and neat and compliant again um, and that strong view on safety moving forward as well. So it's just been a great opportunity when we haven't had people around. Um, to, yeah, everyone might have had a bit of a panic attack when they've seen all of our trenches dug through the campground. But it's been a great opportunity to be able to do some of that work that you just can't do when people are staying there. So, um, yeah, it just neatens it all up. And, uh, again, that focus on safety as we move forward to make sure that, um, yeah, we're, we're doing the best that we can from, from this horrible situation. Thanks. Sounds thanks, good. Uh, Yankees, can you hear me? Yeah, Yankees, I'm here. Um, would you like to give us a quick update on things to do with FOBs? Um, yes, that would be my pleasure. Of course, there is a, a couple of things happening with FOBs. One was the, uh, the original fundraising uh, thing that was set up immediately after the fire. In total, um, we've received roughly $130,000 uh, on, on those fundraising activities. Um, the other thing that we did is we applied for a grant because, of course, we lost all our tools and the shed. And we were granted $13,000 by the Gambling Community Benefit Fund. Um, there were three things on that on that grant. One is a defibrillator that we would be keen to donate back to Benabar as we did before. Um, that defibrillator is now sitting in my garage and will be delivered to the lodge. You know, once once I get to the area, 
before yeah. it's all open. Um, the second thing is, is there's a lot of, lot of tools on that ground. And the third thing is the shed or, or container. We were talking about that before the grant was uh, submitted. Um, if you go for a shed, you need to have a, a real um, a slab and a, and a good quality shed, but it, is, it has to be fixed in one location and that's it. Um, if it's a container, you have more flexibility, but of course you need to include that your container has to be um, you know, covered in, in foliage or whatever to make sure that we don't have an, an unsightly, ugly container on site. Um, so with Jonathan coming on board and all the plans for the, for the site, uh, please keep in mind um, what would be the right decision for um, that container slash shed to do. Um, I have uh, probably a possibility to get a container for, uh, for free, which is one with a little side door that I have used for, a, for an op shop thing for years, and that is most likely available to us. So if we could use that one, uh, we have some money to make sure that it doesn't look too ugly and we would have more money for tools, which would probably also benefit Binabara um, in general. Mm. But uh, those are, uh, are probably the main things. Um, so I would be keen to, to uh, see, participate or hear from, from you back what the, uh, the ideal thing is in terms of shed versus container. And um, we'll talk about the delivery of the defibrillator in the, in yeah. the, in the near uh, future. Yaki, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. May I suggest let's give Jonathan a week or 10 days, get his feet under the table. And yeah. then we should have a meeting with uh, FOB's uh, management um, um, with Jonathan and perhaps with Tim and Lou also. Um, and just look at the the needs and the logistics and locations. Um, yeah. so, great, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the I'll just go through the list here um, and do the low hanging fruit with the questions. Uh, Karin, you asked about materials and panels for the groom's cottage. Uh, yeah, we're pretty well organised in terms of um, what's required there. Um, and also the requirements that were under, because we're under the Queensland cultural landscape component of the heritage register, um, the processes we need to go through with anything we do there. Uh, Michelle made a little comment to me privately in relation to the water tanks that we are, because of the cost of cleaning up the current water tanks, we are looking, we might look at putting new water tanks in and using the existing water tanks for fire mitigation work. That's a dis an operational decision that's still in the process. Ian, Ian Herbert uh, asked a question. Um, what is our source of funding for renovations of the tea house? And what is the extent of our bank loads, loans and is it sufficient for these additional works? Uh, that, Ian, that's a question we focus on on a daily basis. Um, Michelle, are you able to add a comment to that? I like to spread the load on these sorts of questions. Um, and that's, Michelle, can you hear me? And are you yes, able you hear to me? make a comment on that one? Would you mind responding on that one? Yes, um, our current relationship with Westpac is very good. Um, we did have a operational overdraft that has been um, removed for the time being. And we're in six month reviews with them. On both existing loans, we have been paying principal interest uh, since the fire in the normal pathway to try and maintain our uh, reduction of that. With our shareholders' loans, we've actually reduced shareholders' loans since the fire. So our level of debt with external debt, i.e. shareholder loans and bank loans, including the chattel mortgages, has reduced since the fire and reduced a significant amount. Now, we have operational cash. We've been developing a cash flow over the last, oh, I don't know, three months in depth to make sure that the cash we have is um, husbanded very carefully and the amount of grants that we've received are going to the right place. So we can't use, for example, the grant money to stabilise the cliffs to do any of the improvements at the tea house. 
So um, I've managed to squeak into the cash flow a couple of hundred thousand left over from the fire proceeds to do some of the improvements. And then we may have to uh, do it in stages. For example, the, the concept of um, redoing the barn as a new bunky type house and facilities there, I think that's a great idea. All in all, we're trying to do all that we can out of the money we have and not borrow any money. So in the time frame of 12 months to 18 months, um, if we can get another grant from QRIDA, that would be wonderful. It would resolve a lot of the capital that we've got planned at the moment. But other than that, we have been just trying to cut our cloth to suit our purse. So we do not want to go into any further debt without really serious consideration. And it can only be, any type of debt we're talking about can only be for a capital improvement where there's a business case that revenue will come to cover that. So everything's, every decision is made really clearly. One, is it what we need for safety? Two, is there a business case to do it? You know, there was an example, and talk about the water tanks. We had a quote, a rough quote, of $45,000 to go in and clean up the existing water tanks. Um, because, you know, we like not replacing things willy-nilly. And then we thought, ah, it'll cost us 22 grand to buy new tanks. So rather than spending money on the existing tanks, to bring them up. Can we spend the same money on getting new tanks and keeping the old tanks for fire mitigation purposes? You know, there's things like that. So to answer your question, no, we're not borrowing specifically for the tea house project. If we get further grants, they'll perhaps speed up the process of these improvements. On the FOBS money, it has been used in a multiplier situation. And, you know, um, for those who haven't seen, the, the, um, the volunteer labour coming from the Belong Group, the Belong Care Group, was enormously multiplying the dollars that Luann was spending up at the campground to get people come in and replanting. How many new plants were there? 5,000 new plants put in? You know, the, the amount of volunteer and pro bono work has just multiplied anything that's come through Bob's, anything that's left over from the um, cash. Um, we still have to be careful and we still have to really promote that when we're open, we're open. Um, i rather Jonathan say to me, oh, Michelle, I've got more labour to put on because we're expecting... 300 visitors um, by car on Saturday, the first Saturday, and let me try and work out the dollars for that. But we've got to get people up to the mountain to make it work. So short answer, no, we're not borrowing for the tea house. We're doing it with our current cash, but we've been really, really careful. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's good to hear, and uh, I'm sure the finances are in very good hands. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you for your question. Um, and I can see you're very eager to say something. <laughs> when we sent out the last email to all of the FOBS members, they were very keen to see how things were progressing up at Pinaburra. Yeah. And welcome, Jonathan. It will be good to work with you. And whereabouts are you from originally, Jonathan? I was, I was born in Guildford, just south of London. Uh, right. about, uh, before I came to Australia, I worked a lot up in the Lake District National Park. So... Um, <laughs> very familiar with the sensitivity of uh, running a, uh, a tourism operation, an ecotourism operation in a very sensitive area. So um, a little bit of relevant experience over in the UK, uh, but I've been in Australia now for 18 years, sort of focused on not-for-profits. And But this is home, so I've got skin in the game and um, uh, need to make sure we get this right. So I look forward very much to working with you. I've worked a lot with, with similar friends of the hospital, friends of Tonga Zoo and so on. So looking forward to working with you. 
just a couple of comments there. Um, when we do the next one, Michelle made a comment about doing some, we can get some YouTube videos and we'll be able to share those uh, and give people uh, not just the photos of what the progress is. That's a good idea. Um, one question was about the books. So in terms of people wanting to make donations of books, we're, we've, we've got the Canungra Art and Books Shop down in Canungra, who's been very, very, Jan's been wonderful as a drop off place. We also, under our MOU with Griffith University, have the opportunity to have uh, drop-off points at the Griffith Library campuses, Gold Coast, uh, South Bank, Nathan, and Logan. Um, but because of COVID and they've cut back on staff, that's been a bit slow, but that's okay. I'll pick up on that. And so we'll have distribution points at the Griffith University libraries for the next one for 12 months. But the, folk, the main one's been the um, Canungra Arts and Books Shop down in Canungra, uh, or people drop them at my place, or I think Anne and Tony have had a few drop-offs and so forth. So um, that's important for us, so we can populate the library with good quality books also. And thank you to Anne and Tony for their help with the, the book so far also. Hi, oh, Heather. Has any further planning been done regarding design of the buildings to replace the lodge and the cabins? Just a little bit, Heather. Tim, do you just want to just make comment on that that process with the planning? <laughs> um, Heather, probably not a lot since the last time we got together as shareholders. We've put some of those into sketches or the architect's starting to do that. Um, <coughs> to be honest, right at the moment, we've been focusing on the rest of the site through its master planning, tea house, grooms, cottage, et cetera. And then once they are underway and once the site has been um, cleared up the top, we're going to get a fully um, surveyed again. And I might add again, that'll be a donation from a uh, digital, 3D digital company. You're going to come up and do the laser um, work for us for, as a pro bono job. So others have mentioned we're getting so much support. The same company also, when we were uh, trenching in the campground, came up and did um, the section we wanted to trench, came and used the laser piercing into the ground to find out where a lot of our pipes under the ground were. So we're getting a lot of support. But the short answer is once we... Um, finish the demolition work, we'll get that work done and then we'll move back into sort of the master planning process. We've partly been waiting for Jonathan to come on board as well. Yeah, that sounds good, Tim, and I presume you're going to put any drafts up for suggestions and stuff like that. So Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, because yep. Yeah. Yep. I think that's going to be the key thing. The shareholders are want to, going to be, want to be able to be part of the process. So that's great. Yeah, that's important. And you get, we get great ideas. You, know? you get... There's always some, you know, there's always a Richard Groom out there with another creative idea. It's great. <laughs> what, so what we mentioned, we, we've recorded this and I've saved the text, the chat room in the text. Leighton is my right hand person with the technology and he's the right generation to do this. Great faith in you, Leighton. Yep. We'll have a URL. Um, Tony and Ann Yankees from the FOB's point of view, that could be shared with FOBS members also if they wanted to have an update from today. Um, and um, so that will be publicly available. This is focused on shareholders, but I use a broader concept of stakeholders because there are many people passionate about Binnaburra and want to see it succeed who are, um, you know, who are outside of being shareholders currently. Uh, yes, in terms of sharing with Sky Lodge owners also. It's a, it's a public document. So mm -hmm. uh, the more people hear about the story of Binnaburra, the better. Uh, it's good for all of us. If there's no further questions, I'm going to finish up this first, very first webinar. Well done. That worked. I'll close the meeting now. Um, unless there's any last question. This is like the auctioneer, isn't it? Going, going, and gone. Thanks, everybody.